Tonight at the 1969 Conference of the Parapsychological Association here in New York City, we we're pleased to, uh, what? <laughs> Our president, Hans Bender, he doesn't think my background is professional enough for this conference, but I'm gonna continue. We are pleased to announce that Eileen Garrett will address us. Known by both parapsychologists and the public, she will present the medium's message. Mrs. Garrett has worked with researchers across the US Britain and elsewhere, and some of you are actually here tonight with us. As a trans medium psychic, she's asked questions about her own abilities and collaborates with researchers to find the principles behind what she manifests. Also, Eileen Garrett has been instrumental to our field's development in very concrete ways. Through the Parapsychology Foundation, which she founded 18 years ago in 1951, she's funded numerous experiments and projects. In addition, the PF and its related press have helped researchers communicate, and its international content conferences have brought us all together. Tonight, we'll hear her perspectives on our field and what direction she thinks we should take. Her talk is sure to be stimulating, interesting, and I'm sure controversial. <laughs> she will be happy to answer questions at the end of her talk. Thank you for joining us here tonight, Mrs. Garrett. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, as you probably know, the Parapsychological Association has been invited to join the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. I believe that uh, their uh, invitation has been this year and it's soon going to happen. Uh, parapsychology is indeed a science despite the fact that I have been known to say that every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I believe in parapsychology, every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I do not. And on Sundays, I don't give a damn. But uh, you might wonder why I say that. It's because I don't think it's para anything. It's not something that uh, is unusual all human beings have this, and uh, I simply seem to have developed it for reasons that have to do with my childhood. I was raised by an aunt who uh, was very critical and who uh, beat me regularly when I showed traits that she did not approve of. One of them was that I had a childhood playmates who no one else could see. This was on an isolated farm in uh, Ireland. And I communicated with them the way I did with the animals, the plants and trees. It was not quite English. It was more like um, symbols and, and through other means of, um, of, of, of feeling and communication. But uh, it was on the day that I saw another aunt appearing with a baby in her arms in the field. And um, I greeted her, but then she said, I must go. And when I told my aunt this, that um, she, uh, she beat me and then she said, um, you must have been listening through keyholes. You were not supposed to know that your aunt was having a baby. Um, and then two days later, we received the information that um, my aunt um, had died in childbirth with the child. And it was at the time that I had perceived her. At that point, my aunt said, you must never speak of these things with other people because you're speaking about them is making this happen. So she then sent me to boarding school. I was not particularly happy there. And perhaps it was to get away from both my aunt and the boarding school that I, I married young. And uh, it was 
a marriage where my husband did not want me speaking of these things either. Uh, in fact, he, he did not want me to work or to do housework even. My aunt had at least trained me in that because he uh, wanted me to do the things that middle-class women were supposed to do. Um, and so one day I went with um, a couple of companions to a seance, which were popular at that time. It was run by the spiritist uh, believers of uh, the society that they had. And as the uh, session was developing, I went into a trance spontaneously and started speaking about the relatives of the people who were there who um, I knew nothing of. And when I came out of the trance and whenever I go into a trance, I never remember anything that I have said or done. I, I remember nothing, but they told me that that's what I had been doing. And so I decided to investigate further. I lived not far from the British Society for Psychical Science. And I um, met people there. And it was Hewitt McKenzie who started training me as a trance medium. Now, this meant that although I did manifest certain physical medium um, activities, such as material uh, emanating from me or, or knocks and raps um, at the table, um, he said not to pay attention to those, that he did not want me to develop that because it took energy away from the sittings with people who wanted to speak to their bereaved relatives. That was what the mission of the society was. He said that um, the controls that came out that I had, first Uvani and then Abdul Latif, who was, uh, he said he was a, a physician in the 13th century, that these um, controls needed to be trained as well. So I did this for um, a number of years. I had weekly sittings. Uh, my reputation grew. One day, Harry Price, a researcher, had me bring forth the spirit of Arthur Conan Doyle, who had uh, passed recently at, at that time. But instead, the pilot of a recently felled aircraft the R101 uh, came through instead. And this pilot described the reasons that the aircraft had fallen and, and uh, what they had tried to do. And uh, many, many details came through. Of course, as usual, I remembered nothing of it uh, when I came out of the trance, but somehow the word leaked to the newspapers and a great deal was made of this. It was investigated by authorities um, in the government even, uh, but it turned out that, that the information was, as, as far as could be seen, accurate. The news of this reached America and I was invited to visit the American Society for Psychical Research and also uh, to be uh, tested by uh, J.B. Ryan um, at Duke University. Now, as you all know, I am very much in favor of scientific parapsychology. However, I must say that the types of experiments that Dr. Ryan was doing were not the most conducive to, um, to having psychic phenomena manifest themselves. They were little symbols on little cards. I believe they're called Zener cards and they were um, boring and repetitive to use. I got my best results when J.B. Ryan himself was the agent for the experiment and sent me the image himself. And it was in the morning when we were both fresh and rested. He did have an enthusiastic, eager personality though, which I think is important for doing this type of research. You know, there are many researchers who feel that they're being objective, but actually they're being dismissive and it makes it difficult for 
the person who is doing the experiment to get their best results. Well, I returned to England and then lived in France for a while and escaped just before the Nazis um, took over. I, I had predicted that there would be another war after the Great War. And I managed to get in a refugee boat from Lisbon in Portugal, which was neutral, and came to America. I felt that I could do my best efforts for Britain and the war effort um, by being in America, um, because America had not yet um, joined in the war, uh, so that my efforts were needed there. And in New York, I did readings for people, although I was beginning to get tired of doing readings because people wanted to speak to their deceased relatives rather than develop themselves or learn more about themselves. And I felt that this was a problem for people that uh, it was a crutch, that they were not learning more about themselves from my doing these readings. And I can do readings psychically as well. I don't have to be in a trance, um, but it came to the same thing if they only wanted to speak to dead relatives. So um, I started developing other uh, activities. I. Uh, had uh, a magazine called Tomorrow. I started my own publishing house, one of the few uh, women in America who had done so. And I also started the Parapsychology Foundation with which many of you are familiar. We too have had conferences, I believe 18 to date, um, because I think parapsychologists certainly need to communicate with each other and often they don't. So uh, through the help of my good friend, Frances Bolton, who was a Congresswoman from Ohio and also an heiress, we funded a number of uh, parapsychology studies, um, the early dream studies of Montague Ullman, um, Ian Stevenson wanting to take a trip to India to investigate uh, reincarnation. You know, I fund things that I am not totally in agreement or, or um, believing in, uh, and that would be true for reincarnation. Um, but I believe one needs an open mind, and, and let's see what the investigation would show. So um, I uh, worked with a number of different uh, researchers, and I remember when um, Stanley Krippner uh, gave me an envelope with, uh, it was another envelope inside of it, and inside the second envelope was a picture, and I was meant to read the picture. And I said, well, this is a man kneeling, and he's under a light fixture. Well, it turned out that it was a picture of a mosque, and uh, it was a man kneeling on a prayer rug, and a chandelier over him. So uh, the reading was accurate, but I have to say that I was also picking up things about Stanley Krippner and about the young man who had put the pictures together um, in the envelopes. So um, I think that researchers need to realize that they, are dealing with someone who will pick up everything connected with what is going on. This means that in a laboratory situation, everybody connected with the laboratory is potentially influencing what the psychic will do and, and the mood of the laboratory, which as I discussed, is very important as well. Another thing that I think researchers need to uh, consider more fully is that the uh, person who has some abilities, such as myself, is a collaborator in the project and needs to be treated as such. That the way that somebody can best function in the psychic situation 
is the way that they should be trying to work with the person as long as scientific protocol is followed, of course. And this is not always done. So those are things that I think researchers might benefit uh, from hearing. Now, I have been asked, oh, you know, over time, what, what do I believe? What don't I believe? I, I think that the controls that I have had um, are offshoots of myself. I have been tested while in a trance with them, not within a trance, um, psychologically and physically, but with many tests. The results have been inconclusive. They were different in America than in Britain, but but still, I think that they are parts of my own personality. And just as someone under hypnosis can develop a personality, um, I'm able to do that in a trance. And it's part of my early experience of disengaging from myself when my aunt was beating me. In fact, I remember one time when I even saw her mouth move, but I didn't even hear the words that came out. I was disengaged. I didn't feel the pain. I didn't hear her. So I, I learned to do that. Now, I also believe that people can learn to be more psychic if they so wish to do that. When I'm not in a trance, I pay attention to my breathing, to my solar plexus, and uh, I try to calm my mind. And that's when things come through. So these are the techniques that work for me. And I believe that they might work for others as well if they wish to develop this ability in themselves more fully. Now, why would somebody wish to develop these abilities more fully? I, I believe that an awareness of who we are and what we are is fundamental to our existence and that it is helpful for humanity to have this knowledge, which this type of knowledge has often been blocked. The knowledge that we are all connected with all living things and possibly with unliving things as well. I have been asked if I believe in the survival of the personality after death. And I can tell you what I do believe and what I don't know. When I was beaten by my aunt after seeing my other aunt with her baby for saying that that's what I saw, um, in revenge, and I'm not proud of this, I went to the pond and killed all her favorite ducklings. And from the dead or dying ducklings, I saw some type of energy emanating and dissipating, spiraling into the, the atmosphere. I have seen this type of energy spiraling into the atmosphere when human beings are dying also, but human beings take a lot longer to die. And so it, the whole process takes a lot longer. What happens to this energy? I do not know. I do think that there is some sort of imprint that we leave on the environment as we live, I have been engaged in um, efforts to make a house less haunted, for instance. Um, and there are some imprints that appear to remain in an atmosphere. It does not mean it is the personality of the deceased, however. And I believe that when you do an exorcism of sorts, um, it works by calming down the individual who lives in the house, whose energy is being utilized by um, the imprint or the, the imprint is created from the energy of the person in the house, who is usually in a, an agitated mental state even before seeing uh, something that uh, appears. So these, these are some of my beliefs and, and uh, experiences that I have shared with you tonight. Um, I hope that they will be of, of uh, 
worthwhile note for those of you doing research or those of you who wish to develop your abilities. You know, the Paris Psychology Foundation is not far from where this conference here in, in uh, 1969 is taking place, the Barbizon Plaza in, on the west side of Manhattan. And um, the Paris Psychology Foundation is on the east side of Manhattan, so you're welcome to come and visit our extensive library while you're here in New York City. And um, with that, I think I'll end for the moment. Mrs. Garrett, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you very much for inviting me.